Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 33 of the podcast. And today I have a wonderful interview with the two awesome ladies that helped me create my book, Karen Solmetti and Janice Brewster Weiser. So these two ladies were responsible for the editing and layout and basically turned my text and images and diagrams into a beautiful finished book. So here it is, Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day. Uh, just a quick description for the audio. Um, of course, got a nice big bold headline, Explore Walking Foot Quilting. My face did make it to the front cover. We figured out a way to uh, use one of the images that I shot of myself. So there's a little square with me. It's kind of like a little mosaic pattern with lots of different images put together with uh, black bands separating. And then we've got two big pictures of a walking foot and two images of the quilts that are included in the book, the quilt patterns in the book too. So I am super excited and so happy about how this turned out. And I gotta say, I could not have created this book without the help of these two ladies that are on the show today. And that's really exciting for me. I love that I've created this podcast and can interview them and share them with you and kind of the process of how we put this book together. And what's cool is when we did that interview, it was several weeks ago. So we were still very much in the kind of nitty gritty stage of putting the book together. And then now we're right at the end and this book is nearly out the door. So it's been a fun process and the pre-order is now available. You can go to leahday.com slash walking foot and pre-order a copy. So um, this copy is one I just printed out. This is actually a draft. And uh, so it kind of gives you an idea just how big this book is. It's massively huge. Uh, it's coming in at around like 150 pages. So it's kind of chunky, you know, it's a pretty big quilting book. Uh, so the pre-order is for the physical print copies. If you want a printed copy shipped to you, or you want an ebook, it doesn't matter which, you can pre-order a copy and get the best deal on the book right now. And we're including a cool bonus. And that bonus is a set of worksheets that you can print out and then practice quilting all the designs. You can use these worksheets to mark the different designs on your quilt fabric and they're big. They tape together to create a 14 inch square with the different designs and nice lines for you to mark. So put that together and that's the bonus for the pre-order. So you not only get a great price, you also get the extra worksheet pack. And more than likely, once we go out of the pre-order time period, we're gonna separate those two things out so the worksheets will actually be their own kind of separate thing. So now is your chance to get them all combined together in one. So I hope that you'll come and check that out. It's at leahday.com slash walking foot. So now let's check in on the updates around the house. I have just actually gotten back from SAF and I was in the mood to do some spinning. So I have pulled out my electric spinning wheel and I finally came up with a name for her. I decided to call her Stella. So this is Stella, my electric spinning wheel. And SAF uh, is like this big, big fiber festival in Western North Carolina. And I was so lucky, my best quilting friend in the world came and met me there. And so we had a wonderful time walking around and checking out all the different booths and, uh, and just had a really chill time looking at all that yarn and we pet some sheep and goats and angora bunnies. Uh, I don't feel any inspiration to get more farm animals, at least not right now, but uh, certainly was definitely the place to go if I was you know, wanting to get into you know, having angora bunnies or something like that. Now, uh, I notice whenever I go to places like that, um, like festivals and things like that, I'm always keeping an eye out for what is catching my eye. So it's almost more important to know what is attracting me and catching my eye and, and what is inspiring me than, uh, you know, like, oh, that cool thing I want to buy. Like, well, why do I want to buy it? I want to know why. And so the thing I noticed is that anything that had black mixed in with it. This sounds weird, but anything with black, I was immediately drawn to that. So um, bright, bright green fabric, uh, sorry, thread and yarn, anything that had black woven into it, I was really gravitated to that. And so 
about halfway through the show, we were wandering around. I was like, I need to go buy some black fleece. I need to get some black wool and, uh, and then just be able to sit and spin that. And then, you know, obviously do some plying and stuff like that to make some black and multicolored yarn. You know, that's obviously what's inspiring me right now. So I need to do that. So that was really good. Found a vendor and bought some black roving. And uh, it was just really nice to have lots of different conversations with people and not specifically quilting. You know, these are more knitting and weaving and uh, kind of a different area of fiber arts, but I still found a lot of things that are definitely quilting related. So found a lot of dyed and felted wool. So I picked this up and uh, I got a couple different pieces. I have a plan to make a landscape quilt with these beautiful colors. Try and hide it, hold it here in the sun, sunshine so you can see it. Beautiful colors of blue. And this was from greenmountainhookedrugs.com. And she said that everything was repeatable. So I, if I needed to get more, I could get some more. And I love these gradient colors. I love it when things change from one color to another, you know, and then I have lots of different choices and I can cut some dark green and some medium green, like hills. I'm thinking a landscape quote with something like this. So that'll be a lot of fun to play with. And the best thing about felted wool like this is you, you can cut it and it's not gonna fray because it's been felted. So I don't have to worry about finishing all those edges. I'll probably still edge stitch around it, but I don't have to really worry about it so much. Let's see what else. Ooh, I finally got to see a, a yarn vendor that I follow on Instagram all the time. And that is the Fiber Seed and got some yarn from them and I'll hold it in the sunlight. It is black with uh, all these, uh, a ra basically a rainbow of color. Uh, so it goes from red through to purple and black is intermix of that. You know what I said about black inspiring me, but I have seen this yarn online so many times and not picked up a, a skein of it yet. And so when I was there, I was like, I have got to go get some yarn from them. So I made sure to pick that up. And let's see here. Oh, the last thing that I thought was so super cool. If you are a knitter, you're gonna wanna get a pair of these. So it's Indian Lank Artisans and they are hexagonal knitting needles. And I would not have thought that that was a big deal at all if you had said hexagonal knitting needles, Leah, it's, it's like a really big deal. I would have said, um, no, not really. I don't really need any more knitting needles. Like I have a huge collection of knitting needles but all I had to do was touch them <laughs> and I was sold. I mean, and of course that's, that's their entire setup. They just had literally a table, knitting needles, yarn. So you could cast on and knit whatever. And as soon as I had them in my hands, I had to have a set. Um, so it feels like a pencil because it's, it's hexagonal. It feels like a wooden number two pencil in your hand. Uh, and there's something about the way the yarn fits over that shape. It feels better to me in my hands. I just love them. So I know I'll be ordering some more of them online. Um, so that was Indian Lake Artisans and uh, really completely, I, I really wanted a pair of uh, uh, double pointed needles for making socks, but he was completely out. Uh, so I was a little disappointed on that, but overall super, super happy just to find those. I had no idea that I would like that. Um, but there you go, you know, sometimes going to big shows like that is really important, you know, not just for finding new tools and new gear, but also just being able to see new things and, and kind of absorb new colors and, uh, and that different environment, it kind of shakes me up. Uh, I tend to stay home and stay put and sometimes I find I just need to see something pretty. You know, I need to see bright colors and pretty things in order to feel, I don't know, alive and excited and ready to, to design something new. Uh, so you might notice I am sitting here, if you're watching the video, just so I'll just kind of describe what I'm looking like today. I and mean, it's not all that great. I'm bundled up and I have a white kind of cotton ball toboggan on that I uh, crocheted a while ago. And then I'm also wearing my big orange uh, scarf that I created. Uh, I actually quilted this just a few weeks ago. 
And I'm all bundled up because the heater is not working in our house right now. Uh, it's kind of sort of working, but not really. So that is needing to get fixed. And that's why I'm looking the way I am today. I really wish that, you know, I could just click it on and everything go. And it's going to get kind of chilly tonight. So that's not going to be a lot of fun. But hey, you know, normal maintenance-y kind of stuff. It happens to everybody. So speaking of things that happen to everybody, uh, I wanted to share a little update about my button mosaic. So if you listened to last week's podcast, you know, I was working on a button mosaic, gluing buttons onto a canvas and having a good time with that. Well, I had this idea that I would grout around them, you know, and, and kind of fill in the whole background area with black grout. Well, I took it outside to play with it today and that did not work out. It epically, epically flopped. Uh, I think the main problem was Elmer's glue was not the right kind of glue to use to set my buttons onto the canvas. Uh, it started to dissolve and just in contact with the grout. And that makes sense because Elmer's glue is a water soluble glue. And so, you know, any amount of moisture is going to cause Elmer's glue to lift off. So that totally didn't work. And then the grout ended up sticking to the buttons really bad. So I fussed and fought with it for a little while and it was just really time consuming and I kept going over it with a sponge trying to get the grout off the top of the buttons and then more buttons kept falling off. Uh, so where I finally just said, okay, what would I rather be doing right now than fussing with this? And the answer was I would rather be going inside and working on a quilt or spinning or something else I felt more like doing today. So I, um, I took the water hose to it. <laughs> I was just like, ah, let's just see what happens. Let's see if I can get, you know, salvage the canvas at least. Uh, and I can't, yeah, that, that's a done deal. The canvas is shot, but I hosed it off and washed out most of the grout. So most of the grout from between the buttons is gone. There's still a lot of grout on the buttons. It just kind of stuck. Uh, and I could stop here and just throw the whole thing in the trash and be done with it. But I looked at it and realized, you know, this is still an opportunity to learn something. And it's also, it could be maybe, I'd say maybe a 20% chance of salvaging it. Uh, I'm gonna try painting in the background with my black Peebo ceramic paints. And so it will go glossy black in the background around those buttons. And I think that that paint might just glue the buttons in just a little bit more firmly too. So that might work or it might still be an epic failure. It, you know, it's really a toss up either way. And I think it's important for you to understand that I, I don't always, like my ideas don't always work out. You know, sometimes they're epic, epic disasters and it's a total waste of my time and materials. But there's a, a lot of wins, you know, a lot of things that I do do work out and I am happy with them. And I think it's all in volume. Uh, I heard a story once about a college professor, I think it was, was in ceramics, and they basically split the class into two parts. And one part they said, you know, you're gonna just make as many pots as you can. Like your goal is a hundred pots. And then in the other group, they said, you know, uh, you need to focus on perfection and figure out what is the perfect pot and only make one or two. And ultimately what came out of that is the kids that made volume and didn't care about perfection, the ones that made a hundred pots, uh, they produced a much wider variety of work and they produced work that was far more interesting and you could say perfect, but you know, that's always in the eye of the beholder. Um, but they produced so much more and that volume taught them so much more and that then resulted in more success. So I believe in volume, you know, even if this button mosaic doesn't work out, I already started another one. So that's okay. I got plenty of buttons to play with. And uh, I learned something with this one. I will uh, obviously pull out some thin set and uh, set the buttons using thin set next time or use paint in the background. It's gonna be a toss up one way or the other. Uh, and either way, I'm not, I'm not sorry that I made the mistake uh, uh, or learn something new. I mean, it kind of went hand in hand, so that was good. So that's pretty much it for the updates around the house. I really hope that you enjoy hearing what I'm working on and the reality of living a creative life. It's not always pretty and it's not always clean. It's sometimes pretty messy and that's okay. 
Uh, I think the point is just to enjoy the process, whether it is working or not, it's still okay. So this episode is sponsored by my new book, Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day. I really hope that you will come and pre-order your copy at leahday.com slash walkingfoot. This is going to be an awesome book that will teach you the basics and beyond for walking foot quilting. We learn 30 beautiful designs and how to use them in seven fun quilt projects. And I included a walking foot whole cloth. I know that might sound like a contradiction, but there is really a thing and I have now made it almost three times. So I can verify you can definitely make this whole cloth quilt with your walking foot. So come and check it out at leahday.com slash walking foot. And now here's the show with both Karen Solmetti and Janice Brewster Weiser. Hello, my quilting friends. Today I'm here with Janice Brewster Weiser and we're going to be talking about self-publishing. So Janice and Karen, uh, they work together as Creative Girlfriends Press, helping clients become published authors. And they are also the awesome ladies working on my new book on walking foot quilting. So I thought it would be fun to have both of you on the show. So Karen's going to be on a little bit later. Right now I'm talking with Janice and we're going to talk about editing and that whole process of turning raw text <laughs> into a book. So let's get started. So um, first off, like, how did you get into this? You know, have you been editing for a long time? How did you start? I have been um, working on publications for a long time. Started with a small, small daily newspaper and then uh, went to a magazine for an education association and then wound up at Log Home Living magazine. Um, and then from there, I was off on my own doing freelance editing and writing, and um, I was at a quilt class with the teacher Kathleen Loomis, who's fantastic, by the way, and I thought, she should write a book. So I pitched it to her, and we got talking, and she said, you should edit my book, and it just, you know, from there, it's all just been history. Excellent. And so you primarily work with quilters, right? I have worked with quite a few quilters and fiber artists, but um, also other topics for books have been, I've just finished up one with a jewelry maker. Um, I worked with a pair of holistic health um, uh, folks on a book for them. So it's kind of run a little bit of a gamut, but all how-to or self-help kind of books, nonfiction. Excellent. And you know, talking about self-publishing, you know, obviously there's there's two different camps kind of here. There's traditional publishing, going with a, a big publisher, and then there's self-publishing, doing a lot of the work yourself. Um, what's your opinion? Which is, which is better to you? Obviously, self-publishing, but tell me a little bit about why. So the really amazing thing about self-publishing, especially now, um, when there's so many ways to get your work out there is that you don't have the time lag that typically takes place when you're working with a traditional publisher. Um, you know, that from, for a typical publisher, the time from coming up with your idea to seeing a printed book could be years. And you know that when you have an idea for a book, um, maybe you're teaching, maybe you're doing a workshop, maybe you're launching something new on your website, you'd like to have that product to sell quickly. Um, and either, you know, to sell it as a revenue stream or to have it as something that you can say, look, I've done this, um, I've published a book on this, and I would be a great speaker for you to have at your quilt conference or something like that. So the wonderful thing about self-publishing is you can do it quickly, um, you know, a matter of months versus years. So that's one of the biggest um, pros. And, um, you know, there's there's people out there to help you like me and there's technology out there to help you like print on demand services. So you really don't need to wait for a major publisher anymore. It's really exciting. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, and, and really, you know, what is the advantage other than, you know, there are some costs, you know, and, and that's kind of like the one disadvantage I think is by self publishing, I, I'm taking on the cost of editing and layout and then the cost of printing some books too. Um, Correct. 
and but you're right you know we no longer have to buy thousands of them like I could buy 20 <laughs> you know it's not that huge chunk of change um, so let's talk about some of the things you guys offer to your clients like uh, what are the some of the services that you provide to quilters or anyone that's needing a book help on their book so I can either come to a person or a person can come to me if they already have uh, something of a draft or a manuscript, I can take it from there and just in terms of editing just the text, which is what I did with my jewelry designer recently for her book. Um, or even if someone just has an idea and wants to talk with me about maybe the feasibility of a book in that topic, we can talk. Um, if someone would like to have design services, that's when Karen and I usually work together to um, get their book not only polished for the words and make it uh, read really well, but also look great too. Um, so that's a service that we offer as well. And we've worked with printers to help uh, people come up with an actual printed book product, or they can choose to do something that's a print on demand, or they can even just go in ebook uh, direction. So kind of cover the gamut there a little bit. Mm -hmm. And how about how long does the editing and layout process take? Well, some of it, of course, depends on where the manuscript is at in terms of whether, you know, it's completeness when I first see it. Um, it could be, and, and it also depends on the motivation of our client. Um, it, that person needs to be, if not really deadline oriented, then someone who I can prod along to be deadline oriented, willing to take direction, let's put it that way. Um, so it could be as short as maybe five months, um, maybe even four, depending on how, um, where the manuscript is in, and the photography is when we start the process. process. Yes, the photos can be the kicker. <laughs> Definitely. That, that is a little bit of a challenge for some of our uh, clients. So we try to help people, if they don't know a photographer, help them find someone. Um, and, you know, it's not insurmountable. But, yes, it is something that they need to really kind of take a lead on. Absolutely. So let's talk about price. That is kind of like, you know, the hard thing to kind of get around, especially for someone that's just starting out. And may, this might be their very first book. Um, right. So what are some ways that you guys can work together and, and help someone, uh, you know, work with someone even when they're kind of on a shoestring budget? Right. Well, our I think our services are pretty affordable, especially when you look at um, what the, the – when they sold a certain amount and that break-even point happens, I don't think that that's terribly far down the line. So yes, there is an investment up front, and it'll probably be in the, you know, depending on the length of the book and how many photos, you know, there's kind of a wide range. They could spend $1,000 just on editorial services. They could spend 3500 on editorial and design services. You know, I hate to put a number really on that because there's some variables there. Um, but like you said, any investment, you can also look at what the return is going to be when you start selling the books. So having a really clear idea about marketing, I think, is also key. And that's one thing that I talk to clients about whenever we start a project. I always say, what's your goal with this product, uh, whether it's a book or an ebook? How do you plan to sell it? What, what will success look like? Um, and I want to make sure that they've got um, some good direction there before we even start the, the process. Because that's, it's important to know what you're going to do with this book when all is said and done. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I would say even the extra tip that if people are asking for the book, then that's the book that you should write. But yes. if no one's asking for it. <laughs> and, right. you know, it's it's like a, a book is a is a tool and it's certainly a branding tool and it's a marketing tool, but it it has no purpose if no one's asking for it, no one's wanting it. Uh, so, you know, and I think that's an important, you know, piece of the puzzle too. Um, I, when I would came up with this idea, this, this book that I'm working on right now was once very big. It was, a, you know, explore all machine quilting and I was going to do all of it. And you've seen the text and how big this thing is. So you can just imagine, multiply that by three. <laughs> that's how big it was going to be. So, you know, it was a process then of consolidation, like, okay, maybe not all machine quilting. And then I was like, okay, I can't talk about 
all of this in one book. And then I was just like, I'm really interested in walking foot quilting. And, you know, I shared some videos on walking foot quilting and a, there was a lot of interest in that. And then I ultimately decided, you know what, I'm going to give myself the, um, the, the gift of focusing on one style of quilting and it was it was great and that worked out wonderfully so I'm really excited about that and I think that's a good way to go about it um do you find that authors sometimes struggle like with narrowing their focus or coming up with one idea absolutely there's you know sometimes a book you want to write about everything you know but there is sometimes well probably most times it's better to really hone that and like you said, find out what people are asking for or go online and do a little research on Amazon, um, you know, what's coming out, what are people more and more interested in, um, ask some questions maybe of your local quilt guild or your quilt shop. Um, that helps you also kind of, you know, crystallize that focus. And crystallized focus is always better when you're writing a book. Absolutely. I and I struggle with that myself. Like, oh, I could do this. And oh, I could do this. And it's like, no, just like narrow it down, you know, tunnel vision. <laughs> so um, what that's interesting what you said about, you know, what's coming out. And I'm sure you've seen this industry changing considerably over the years. So what are some things that you're seeing in the publishing industry in general? So there's been a lot of change in publishing, obviously, just in the means, like we talked about before, and the ability for more people to get voices out there. Um, and I think that people are looking for maybe in some ways more like quick hit kind of things, um, looking to buy patterns maybe to work on, um, maybe not necessarily a whole book. So there's a maybe some changes in there. Um, but I think, you know, the crafters and quilters and um, makers in general, they just love books. They're always inspired by new things that are out there. So I think even though there are some things in the industry where you see certain publishers not, uh, you know, not publishing books anymore, I still think that there's a market. Um, I think it's just industries change and more. Um, but I think makers will always want that new inspiration. Absolutely. And I, I think there's still something about that physical book. I mean, ebooks are great, but I still want a physical copy. How about you? Absolutely. I'm a total junkie for a printed copy. Yeah. Well, and especially when you're making something, I just find it's easier to have the book propped next to me while I'm at the machine or, you know, using it when I'm measuring and cutting. It, to me, that just makes it a little easier than than dealing with the technology too. But I think there's probably a whole generation behind me that's in a different spot. Absolutely. So there are a lot of skills involved in writing the book as, as everyone can probably tell just in what we're talking about and stuff. What are some skills that you feel like are really important to have already built before you start writing the book? Well, I think organization is key. Um, you want to be on top of things and, and know that this book, why it's important to you and where you're going with it, that's important. Um, I think you want to be able to have, to have solid skills in what you're teaching. In fact, if you felt like you wouldn't be able to teach something, it would probably not be a good thing for you to write a book about. Um, and have some breadth within the technique as well. If it's a technique that you can demonstrate and you could maybe demonstrate it in five or ten minutes that's probably not a technique to write a whole book about you know it's something that people are going to learn and maybe go through as beginners for a little while and then really hone their skills more it's a little more meaty I think that's um, if you have the experience with that technique that you could take people through those different levels I think that's important Yes, absolutely. And to have those different levels, too. Like, here's beginning, here's kind of something you could do in the middle, and then here, like, you know you're showing off your skills <laughs> if you're making that quilt. You know, that's the, how I looked at it when writing this book. I really wanted to have at least one quilt that was like, I wanted people to question whether that was walking foot quilted or not, you know, and it's, it's, a, right. it's a whole cloth quilt. So, and I managed to put that in there. So I was really tickled about that. So we've worked on three books together so far, and I feel like with every book, I've learned so much. We've gotten faster. We've gotten better at it. 
Um, do you feel the same? And, and do you know of any systems that you've identified that will make the writing process faster and more streamlined for people? I'm not sure about a system, but I know that for some folks, if they get, um, like my jewelry maker, for instance, she had sent me some chapters that she really was just kind of outlined on. And that was fine because I was able to look at her outline and say, here are the questions that I would be asking that you would need to answer when you write this chapter. So um, I think instead of struggling, people can always look to an editor to help them shape a manuscript. Um, I think that that makes it go more smoothly. And a and good editor also notices when there's redundancies. Um, a book is a big animal, and it's hard to remember, wait, have I talked about this before? Have we covered this? Um, so having that other set of eyes, even though it's not systemized and it's very personal, um, it just helps with you know making sure your manuscript is as good as it can be. Absolutely. I completely agree. And that was one of the struggles that I had with writing this book was figuring out the structure, like what goes where and when, you know, all of a sudden when you have this, you know, and this is my first project based book, I had to make that decision, like, where do the designs go? Where do the projects go? And where do I write about all the nitty gritty stuff that everybody needs to know first, you know, and so Figuring that out was, it took several months to figure out where it should all fit. And even now we might end up shuffling around on some of that, right? Right. And your manuscript was in super good condition when you sent it to me. I mean, it was really, um, you had it nailed down. So I could tell that you had put time into it ahead of time. But that can be something that someone works on by themselves, or it could be someone that someone works on with the help of a professional. Either way. Yeah, I've been reading a lot more about writing and, and, you know, kind of reading books to work on my craft. And that has been so helpful. And these have been books like some of the books are, are on fiction writing, not even nonfiction. But just understanding structure better has been really helpful for making that faster. And I feel like I feel so much more confident about this book than I have the others in the past. And so that's felt great, too. Um, so you have a new pattern publishing service. Tell me about that. Well, it's kind of in its infancy. I, um, I've published a, a handful of patterns myself and, and marketed them through Craftsy and had some success there. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, I'd love to help other folks who have original designs um, to have their patterns published as well. You know, we've all done the craft shows and you have your table filled with things that you've lovingly made and someone will go by and say, I could make that. And, you know, that, you know, you could think, oh, why don't you just buy it? Because you'll never get around to making it. But <laughs> there are a lot of people who would like to know how to make something. So if you're the person who is making, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 of a certain item and it's your own design, why not publish a pattern as well? Because there's always going to be the person that wants to make it themselves. Why not have that be one of your customers as well? So um, I'd love to hear from any of your listeners that have um, original designs and would like to talk about the process. Um, because I think it's a nice one to tap into. Um, you know, a book length project is a big deal. Um, you know that. So because it just takes focus and a certain amount of dedicated time where a pattern, you may have already put time in to designing it, and the time that it would take to actually publish it would be less. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work in the upfront has already been done. So I'd love to help folks do that. Um, I think it would be an interesting new line for Creative Girlfriends Press. Um, so it's just a part of the business that I'm, I'm just starting to kind of poke at and um, would love to hear from folks if they have ideas. Yeah, certainly. And I think that's such a great, you know, that's such a great area. And it's kind of, um, it's writing a book light. <laughs> you know, it's like a little cookie exactly. instead of the right. big cookie. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Wonderful. Well, uh, anything else that you'd like to add and share about your services helping people self-publish? You know, um, the one thing I love about this is that I'm just, I love nurturing people's creativity. And the chance that I get to nurture the creativity of the author is a lot of fun. But then I'm also helping that author nurture other people's creativity. So it's just a win-win-win all the way around. And that's um, I've been able to work with just amazing clients. And I've been lucky. And I feel like 
it's been a blessing for me and hopefully for all the people who read our books. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your help on my book. I really do oh, appreciate that. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Leah. Hello, my quilting friends. Today, I'm here with Karen Salmanetti from Salmanetti Designs and half of Creative Girlfriends Press. And we're going to be talking about her side of that business and how she helps people with layout and design and how she works with freelance clients and helps basically helps creative people self-publish their books. So welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Leah. So let's get started with all your hats. I mean, you do a lot of different things. Uh, so what is your main thing that you're doing right now? Uh, for your book? Well, for my book, and like I, that's one thing I should say. Karen is the layout artist for my book, for the new Walking Foot book, and she's helped me out with several books in the past. Uh, so yeah, you're working on that, but then you're also freelancing with other people too, right? Yes, so I work with a rather large publishing um, company here in Washington, D.C., which is where I'm based, and uh, it's the City Magazine, Washingtonian, so I do some freelance work for them, and then I also do some work for the Washington Auto Show, which is held once a year, so we're gearing up for that. Uh, I have my first uh, client meeting this week, and then we start into layout and design in December. So working on a magazine, I'm sure that's really different from working on a book. Uh, so how do you approach that? Uh, you know, I'm sure it's just two different beasts, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so they're similar in the fact that there's copy and there's photos. But then when you add in the magazine realm, there's advertising and there's much more structure, if you want to say. So you have to you know, fit within the magazine page count as well as uh, account for all the advertising, which, of course, pays the bills. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so let's talk about the creative side of it and how you help quilters and, you know, people like me uh, basically take words and diagrams and photos and turn that into a beautiful book. So where does that start? So um, it's been wonderful working with uh, quilters like you and then um, Janice, our, our editor, and I get the your your ideas, your brain power, and I read about them. And then the the main part, fun part for me, is to get the images because once I read all the text and the copy that you've developed and written, then uh, I like to explode the page with the images as well. Absolutely. And that was actually kind of the struggle for me with this book is, um, you know, I, I really didn't have the cash to hire a professional photographer. So I had to hurriedly learn how to take good photos <laughs> all by myself. Uh, and yeah, that, and there, there's lots of elements into that, you know, photos and um, subject matter and making sure you um, visually describe what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. And so when you're working with uh, different professionals, you know, whether it's someone just getting started and writing their first book, what are some of the skills that you really encourage people to build that would be really helpful for making a really solid book? So uh, uh, the first thing is to, to be organized with your thoughts. So if you have this great idea, this great a creative mind, this great creative product that you develop and want to share with others is, you know, start with that wonderful idea, but then you have to break it down and be organized um, with how you want to teach others or share with others, however you do it. Um, and then that's your copy. And then after you write your copy, then you want to think visually on here, how you want to share your ideas and creativity and, and products with, with others. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think is so important, having a professional edit and then having a professional layout. Those are the things that really set a traditionally published book apart and you worked in the traditional publishing industry, is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, for many years and uh, worked with many publishing companies, uh, mostly magazines, but then several of the other organizations had a whole book department, so that was that was fun too. It's nice with books because you have uh, you can 
continue your ideas and continue um, your layouts and designs without having to worry about breaking up the story or breaking up the chapter with other advertising or elements. Um, so with a book, it's one solid idea, you know, product. So that's mm. kind of fun for me. I love book design. It's, it's, yeah, it's, um, how do I want to say it? it it's, a, it's a canvas all about one idea, one creative process. Absolutely. And my struggle has been kind of narrowing that down, you know, and it, and it, that's always my struggle is kind of picking the topic and, and making it small enough. Um, what would be some tips on that? You know, whether it's, it's just a single focus or, or a, um, a more limited topic, do you think that makes a book better or more easier to lay out and write? Um, that, that's a tough question. Um, because, Yes, I think a single topic is wonderful uh, and more zeroed in on how the book can um, be uh, designed and laid out. Um, but you also want to make sure you have enough content in there that, that your clients and followers want to purchase it so it has some value. So you always have to think what has value and how your knowledge and your creativity can share with others. I do agree with you is you don't want too many ideas in one book, um, but if you could zero in on one or a few, you know, you also don't want too little of a subject, um, but you also don't want, definitely don't want too, too broad of a subject. Yeah. And when you're first getting that text and those photos and kind of starting to think of the design and things like like little things, I never used to think of the importance of font, you know, and turns out that's a whole big deal. <laughs> so tell me so about it that. It is a really big deal. And um, it, it, it's, it becomes the personality of the book that you're trying to develop. It becomes you know, part of, of the personality of your, of your creative, whether it's quilts or art or whatever it is you're doing. Um, so I love fonts and, um, fonts have really exploded into lots of, uh, different avenues and personalities. Um, I I'm also, I also feel like, um, the more work I do is a more informational design. So I'm taking your information and I want to make sure I'm relaying that to your, um, to your clients and your followers. Uh, so you also don't want to get too crazy or too, um, decorative. Um, but you want to actually, actually make sure the information is relayed properly in a, in, um, in a clean way. Yes, yes, that's so important. And that's that's actually something that came up with Janice and I when we were editing is, you know, she had an edit on um, on how, like, the sizes and cuts are, are like, how that's written. And I kind of had to go in there and go, like, no, I'm not going to change that because I can't read it. Like, you know, sometimes I, I look at a pattern and I can't read it when it's written actually the correct English way. <laughs> So, you know, that's a decision that I make as an author. Like, I'm just not going to write it the right way because I can't read it the right way, you know. Um, and I think that we all have to make those decisions and 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 sometimes kind of, you know, make it our own. And I think that self-publishing definitely gives us that opportunity. What are some other benefits that you, that you think self-publishing really, you know, really is the way to go for creative people? Because I think so many creatives have so much to offer that self-publishing allows the smallest niche or the smallest idea or the smallest creativity project an avenue to share with others and to let others expand their creativity with a, a, a self-published book by, by anyone. So it, it's so nice that it's much easier and much more available to be able to share your ideas with hundreds and thousands of other people. 
Absolutely. I completely agree. Like there's so many times that I'm like, gosh, I wish there was a book on that. And it's like a niche, niche craft, you know, like hand turned wood spindles for spinning yarn. You know, won't somebody make a book on that? You know, I know it's so silly, but at the same time, like all of three people want to do that. But there's someone out there that's an expert at it. And I just wish they'd write that book, you know? Right. Yeah, I think that's yeah. great. And yeah. isn't it true, and, and you know, this is something I picked up over the years, that volume really is the key. That, you know, it's not ever going to be just one book, you know? And I mean, obviously, we're thinking about the one book that we're working on right now, right this second. But the real key to being in this game and winning at it, you know, staying in the game, is multiple books produced over a lifetime of, of a career, right? Yes, and I agree. So, so that it's, so you can um, facilitate, um, you know, a, an expanded life of of the creative, of the product, of you, um, and what you want to share. So, absolutely. Yeah, and I I always feel like there's so much more I want to put in, and then my husband is always like, "Well, that's another book." You know, don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. That's another whole book, you know. Well, and that goes back to, yeah, you, you want to make sure you have a good subject, but not too much and definitely not too little. So Exactly. And this was our first time, this was my first time writing a book that had projects in it. And that was a very different layout. So I've written books about um, just quilting designs. They're just picture books, which are you know fairly simple. And then this book is a project book. So I kind of looked at other quilting books that had projects in them and kind of pulled, you know, and, and looked at how those were laid out. Um, do, would you think that that's a good way for another quilter if they're like, um, I've got this kind of weird book idea. Should we be looking at other books for inspiration and trying to find something that's kind of similar to our idea? Is that a good place to start for layout ideas? Absolutely. Uh, inspiration c- can come from other books. Um, you know, part of my my inspiration comes from going to the bookstore, but you know, it can be a magazine. It can be a book. Um, television is another one, uh, you know, cause there's so uh, much media thrown at us. Um, my, my inspiration comes from the outdoors. You know, I love getting on my bike or going for a walk with my dog. So I get a lot of inspiration from nature in and of itself. So, um, but, um, yeah, so so I think other books is a great way to start to see how other people have done it. And you can look at it as what's a good result and what's a not so good result. So, you know, I think adding your um, actual projects in this book is, is an added benefit, you know, and, and it's um, it helps for, you know, for people who want, you know, feel like they're getting their their money's worth. Absolutely. And that was, a, it was a challenge, you know, to create the patterns and figure out how the designs worked and when everything came in. And I actually spent two months like, okay, how is this going to like, what chapter is what? How is this all going to flow together? And it took looking at other books and how they struck, you know, managed that and organized that and, and came up with a, you know, with a layout that I think makes sense. Kind of all the designs are in one chapter, then all of the patterns are in another chapter. And we've got, you know, some chapters of basics and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, that was a little bit of a struggle to figure out how that would flow. Right, right. You almost have to go back to your your, your school days where, you know, how, how to write a paper or how to do a letter, you have to have your introduction and your, and, you know, basics. And then, you know, you did great. And then you added your projects and then you did the troubleshooting and the, and the, you know, other things to look out for. So, yeah. So, um, have you ever gotten a hold of a book and you've just been kind of like, let's shuffle this around. How did you manage that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that, sometimes that can be tough because most of the time I like to give the client what they want. And Janice has such a good eye for things. But when it, when it comes down to it, you know, you just have to, you know, lay it on the line and say this part would be better first. And instead of, you know, two, three and four would be better than one, two and three. So it's it's all visual, it's all how it's going to flow and what makes sense because sometimes when you're entrenched in the product or the process, it's really hard to step back and see 
Yes, I completely agree. Sometimes it's hard. And, you know, I, I had that photo shot list. And then when I actually started seeing the photos on the page, it was like, I don't think I need all of these <laughs> actually here. I mean, it was great right. that they're there and they're shot. Uh, but once you start looking at it, then it's kind of like uh, that maybe not quite that much or maybe some more over here, you know, and it kind of all shovels around. And I got to say, that's the magical part, I think, is, is seeing everything kind of starting to come together and it feels so real. And that's just, it's amazing. I mean, it's like you're a magician. Right. <laughs> We, we used to say, oh, it's just pixie dust, because a lot of people don't understand how an idea like yours, you know, comes to Janice and I, and and they, it's, a, it's a process, and it's, it's, you know, yes, we work on computers, but, you know, it's, it's our canvas, and we have to share the love and the, and the creativity of someone else, and yet it becomes ours, too. Exactly. So let's talk about that a little bit. What are the programs that you're using for laying out a book? So uh, I'm all on Macintosh and I use the Adobe Creative Suite. So it's InDesign, Photoshop, and Illustrator. All three. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So those are the main ones I use. And then I have a huge font um, collection. Yeah, you've done a, a little bit of like, a, there was a, some text uh, in the book that says Leah's toolbox. And that looked like you created that yourself. Is that right? No, no, I didn't. That's what I, that's what I was saying earlier. There's so, so many fun font ideas and, and um, products out there. You can find a lot of stuff. Yeah. And a lot now, as you can know, you know, like at the Starbucks, they have the, the chalk scripty font and there's, there's so much out there that it's actually a font. Really? So yeah. you can just type it in? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you have to purchase the font. but <laughs> <laughs> That's super cool. So, in, you know, if somebody was getting started, let's say their very, very first book, and they have never done it before, and they really don't have a lot of cash on hand to put it together, what are some ways that you and Janice, you know, try and work with people on a, on a, you know, shoestring budget to bring a book into fruition? Well, uh, you know, make sure you come up with an idea. And if you haven't done it before, you could, uh, you could share an outline, you know, a, a concept and an idea, and then an outline of how, how you want to put a book together. Share that with Janice, and I'm sure uh, she can lead you down the right um, avenue. You want to make sure, you know, once, once you speak to an editor, you know, make sure you um, get as much text as you possibly can and do, do all the editing. Um, taking your own photographs uh, can save you some money. Um, but that's, those are some ways to get started is to do a lot of it yourself. Yeah, yeah, kind of bootstrapping it a little bit. And I did that for years. And, you know, and it worked, you know, and I, and I wrote uh, two books, you know, all by myself, basically, and did the editing and did the layout. And honestly, there reached a point that I just I said to Josh, like, I don't want to write unless I can get help. Because it is such a huge task. And I feel like it's so important to get help on a task that big, you know. Um, well, yeah, and I think there's a professionalism too when you when you hire and can work with people who've done it most of their careers, you know, versus whatever your subject is, that's what you're the professional and the expert in. You want to give give the, the editing and the design and layout to the professionals. Exactly. That's what I, you know, I was saying I'd laid out a, a book. It was an ebook that I kind of turned into a real book. And I did this a couple years ago and it was like a slug of two months just beaten at this thing. And I said, I'm not a book layout artist. <laughs> it's not my job. That's not a hat I want to wear, you know? And, you know, and it is expensive, but I look at it and, you know, and think, well, here's a month of my life that I've, I've handed the book to you and I've relinquished control and I've just said, please make it pretty <laughs> and I'll get it back and it'll be ready to go. And I will not have had to work that hard on it. And I'm, and during this time, I'm spending so much time doing other things and getting ready right. for this book launch. So to me. Right. And then, and you have to set your priorities too in, in what you want to spend your self-worth on. Exactly. So, absolutely. Yeah. And I do think it's an investment. And um, to me, at least it feels like almost like having a baby. 
So, you know, it's an investment yes. of time and energy and money. And it's like at Publishing the end. Publishing a book is like birthing a baby. Absolutely. Exactly. And it needs to take about that much time, too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and that's what you were saying. You know, you give some advice. You know, you have to think of the time it will take to develop your ideas and write it. And All of that. Like that so. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show with me and sharing all of your tips and tricks and experience. Karen, I really do appreciate it. Can you let everyone know where they can find you online and learn more about you? Yeah, it's Karen, and you can uh, email me at karen at com or go to my website, com and see all my samples and all my photos. I also take, I like to travel, so I take a lot of photos. So yes, please come visit me or contact me. And thank you so much, Leah. Thank you. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far, so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt.